So today I'm going to do a brief introduction into a number of issues related to digital technology and artificial intelligence, but not techno technical ones, but those related to societal impacts and ethical issues. And we already started uh, to make start with that uh, two days ago, but here I summarize some of the big issues. And you have to not only to do a project, um, use case project, but also to write an essay on issues of societal impact and ethics. And this gives some background. Suppose you are an AI, an AI algorithm. And then I might pose to you the question, is this Holland? And if you are not Dutch and have never been there, you have no clue. The Dutch people, the Dutch algorithms uh, among us would say, probably this is Holland, but it's not at all representative. So the photo is from Holland, but you only see this in a very small part of the year, typically early May, when tulips are flowering. Um, so you see that this is perhaps Holland, but the photo is biased, not representative. And bias is a key thing in digital technology and artificial intelligence and data analytics. Bias is everywhere. So you might say it's a universal local phenomenon. And uh, bias is to be used as a neutral term. So it can be good, it can be bad, or it can be anything. But it has to do with a rough picture of reality or a selective picture of reality that you simplify things. Um, stereotype is a, a typical term. So this is not the Holland, the reality of Holland, but it is a stereotype of Holland that they typically do for marketing and tourism. You might also call it cliche. It has to do with prejudice, or it has to do with lack of knowledge or misunderstanding. But whatever it is, um, it is a form of bias. And bias is a key thing in uh, the consideration of the AI, impact of AI and digital technologies and data technologies in general. Um, this is something we already had. The confusion, uh, what time does our class start? Is it 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 5 p.m.? This is also a uh, bias that is introduced because there is context, 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 a situation. We are living in different situations. In this case, different time zones. And the context is key to what something, and that might be text or image or gesture or object or a sound actually means. And this is something that came across in several AI webinar talks. And it's also very beautifully seen in uh, the thumbs up, up picture and animation that I took from Francis. Francis explained that for Westerners, this means thumbs up, but he explained that in Ghana, making such a gesture, gesture actually would be an insult like putting up your middle finger, probably. So context and culture, and culture is often defined as the way we do things around here, colors how we look at the world, but also colors uh, how AI algorithms look at the world.
A very beautiful example that things can go wrong is um, this translation. This is for, a forward backward uh, translation. He, you start with, he is a babysitter, she is a doctor. You translate it to Turkish. Then you put in the Turkish text and you translate it back into English. And what you see is that he is a babysitter, suddenly has been trans back translated into she is a babysitter. So the babysitter has suddenly changed from male to female. And the background of that is bias in the algorithm, in this case, the translation algorithm of uh, Google, that it apparently knows that babysitters are stereotypically female. So, and the translation algorithm actually takes that into account and therefore puts out the wrong gender. So this is a good example that, and um, also you have to note that the facts may be right. So for example, it may be correct that most of the babysitters are actually female. Still, you get a biased uh, translation. Um, this might be strange, but not terrible, but uh, there are um, very severe cases of societal impact by AIs and digital technologies where things terribly go wrong. And I made a few examples, and that's why I single out the Netherlands. Uh, there is a personal dimension in ethics. What should I do or what should I not do? But there is also a systemic dimension that is related to society as a whole and embedded uh, structures, uh, for example, embedded bias in, in racism, for example, or gender uh, bias. And one of the uh, important examples in the Netherlands where things terribly went wrong, also because of how systems work, and, uh, is uh, there has been a very big tax and social benefits uh, scandal as a result of which the whole government had to step down. And what happened was that there was a systematic uh, discrimination of people um, they were seen as people who tried to commit fraud without any ground. And in fact, that was based on ethnic and racial profiling. So et ethnic and racial bias in the systems they have been using at the tax uh, authorities. Um, another example, and that's also a systemic example, is that facial recognition um, is reasonably okay for white people, but terribly bad for black people. Another example is what is called filter bubbles in social media. And here you see that uh, bias is systematically exploited and even enhanced by Facebook as part of their profitable business model. So this is also a systemic issue, not just a personal issue. So in general, machine bias is in the whole data value chain. So it's not just in the input data, it can be also in the processing algorithm, it can be in the output data, and it can be in what you are going to do with it, for example, in decision making. And um, a recent example is uh, the work of Timnit uh, Gebru. She worked on uh, language processing and she wrote a critical paper on how Google did it. Uh, the the uh, title of the paper is Stochastic Parrots. And um, uh, that was critical about the uh, large set of data Google was um, <clears throat> using and the danger that the, uh, just came uh, that you had partly random results. That's why it's called stochastic parrots. The machine just parrots 
in a stochastic way what humans uh, put in. So the conclusion, and actually she was forced out of Google because of this. And the reason seems, the real reason seems to be that Google did, did not want any possible criticism on its own algorithms. So machines do reflect, reproduce, and sometimes even enhance bias of humans themselves. And that might be both individual, but also those biases embedded in societal structures and in our cultures. If you look into the literature, um, there is uh, quite a lot of, uh, and I made a set of selected articles available uh, for Canvas, but um, there are many AI principles and many, uh, and here you see a big, uh, big list that is based on a systematic literature review by Robin and colleagues. One of the issues is transparency. In a lot of machine learning, something happens, but you cannot explain what comes out of it and why the machine does what it does. Just as a fairness, I gave you the Dutch example here, clearly just as a fairness was violated. A principle that also uh, comes along quite often is what is called non-maleficence. That means don't do any harm if you foresee that that might be an impact. Um, responsibility has to uh, do with if a machine does automated decision making, um, who is responsible for the decision? Beneficence is try to do good. What is also interesting here is uh, at the end, dignity and solidarity. Uh, if you want to have uh, AIs doing things for people, they should not violate the dignity and respect uh, of people. So there is a, um, a big list of issues you can consider. These are different dimensions of uh, ethics, basically. And this will be going to play some role in the essay you are going to write. So what I suggest is, um, <clears throat> orient yourself on the uh, impact and ethics issues related to digital technology. And the easiest way to do that is view a uh, talk on the digital humanism channel on AI and ethics by Professor Ricardo Baeza Yates. Um, I give here the link and you scroll down and then you see what is in the picture and you can follow the whole lecture of about one hour. That's the fastest way to get an overview. Um, you can read some scientific articles and I made a selection that I think are not, is not too long and gives a kind of representative view of what the discussion now is in order to get some helicopter view. And uh, do this, uh, scan the headlines. Uh, you can always come back to an article later in detail if it is really relevant to what you are doing. What you then do, and that's also what you do uh, if you have done several interviews, you look at commonalities uh, <clears throat> across different uh, papers from what are their key concepts or what are the key messages. And if you do that with a set of articles I made available, you see that the talk principles, guidelines, checklists, and questions are key concepts uh, in the area that talks about impact and ethical aspects of uh, artificial intelligence. And you also see checklists, and for example, and that is also in the set of articles, uh, Microsoft and other companies uh, have developed uh, ethical checklists, for example, and you, uh, in the same sense as you find it in the medical area. Then for you in your essay, it is important to ask the right questions. 
and that will be not uh, all these checklists uh, and principles are general things, but you have to specialize. Uh, so you can consider uh, a checklist questions. You can consider the questions we have put up in the uh, syllabus. Uh, you make your own decision about that, depending on your own case and your own preferences. Um, in writing, you might uh, start actually with take a set of uh, general relevant questions uh, or uh, perhaps a checklist you find. W what I always will do is uh, narrow that down to some questions relevant in your use case. And you have to specialize a reduced set of questions uh, to your use case. Then the step is impact, imagine, and that's somewhat creative and sometimes even speculative. The question is, what might happen? What kind of impacts could my system, uh, when it is uh, rolled out, what kind of impacts on people could it have? So you imagine relevant scenarios that might provide uh, benefits, but also might produce risks. And here you typically think from the point of view of the people or the stakeholders that are important and what they do and also in what kind of context um, they operate. And then finally, in investigating the answers to the questions you have posed yourself, you might assemble related literature, have discussions with your colleague, with your in your project or outside your uh, project. Uh, so then you build up the relevant literature from your own questions. That's um, and I this approach I would actually recommend. Then the final announcement. Um, this. Uh, track on uh, societal impact and ethics of digital technology. Uh, we uh, have a number of further lectures on this. And on the upcoming Friday, Prof. Uh, Sadito will give a lecture, Knowledge for Service, Digital Technology, Positives and Negatives in African Rural Societies. That's uh, the normal class hours. And uh, a week later, Professor Giulielmo Tamburini, he is from the University of Napoli in Italy, uh, will give a talk uh, entitled AI and Ethics, Structural, Local and Global Issues. And actually, he is a philosopher working in uh, the area of science, technology and society, working for a long time on the ethics of robots and also the ethics uh, and the problems related to regulation of autonomous weapons. So uh, that is yet another area. Um, and he has a long standing reputation in this uh, field. That's it for now. Um, this afternoon, I'm available for uh, questions uh, on uh, the essay, for example. Okay. Okay, thank you, Hans, for a very nice um, lecture. Maybe there are questions. Uh, yes. Yeah, there is a question by uh, Maria about the literature. Where can we find literature? Uh, so she says, I have been searching for art articles to the essay for this Friday, and I don't know how to find all the articles that are in the digital humanism book. Um, yeah, um, no, the, uh, the book is not yet published, so we will first, uh, what I did, uh, but that must be still, uh, I have the same problem. The literature is very recent, very fast, and so make a good selection uh, is pretty hard work, I can assure you. So I have a, a dozen of relatively short articles um, um, and they are in a mailbox uh, with Anna. And uh, I think uh, that, that set of uh, a dozen articles is a good starting point. 
they are all uh, come from different areas and they are all uh, very recent. So we will put up that uh, in Canvas. I have already done that. Oh, you have already done that. <laughs> and I will I will show now the students because maybe not everyone do, knows how to use Canvas. So maybe it's it's useful if I if I just show you where I have put it. So I will um, start sharing my screen. Um, so um, there there is a so if you go in, in, in Canvas, so you have the homepage uh, that you probably all have seen uh, in which all the announcements are all, all, all there, and uh, an overview of the course. So every, every announcement that you receive from me is, uh, is in the homepage. Um, and I, I put everyday announcements about the next day. And here is some uh, overview of the course. But then on the left side, you see uh, in a column, you see uh, other pages. And the most important page is modules. Of course, there's also assignments and assignment is also important, but in modules, you can follow this whole, whole uh, course and all the materials that we use. So if you go to the modules page, then there is a general information and there are some, uh, yeah, some general files about it. Then there is the per week, uh, I have divided um, the course. So the first week is already documented here. Also, the webinar is, is fully documented with all the all the slides of the lectures. And of course, I've also put the videos on the homepage. You can find them. Then there is the second week in which we are now. And I put every lecture here, all the materials. And I have just put all the 12 uh, articles that Hans uh, sent me about AI and ethics uh, here. Uh, and they are all listed here. So you can just click on them and, and read them. So that uh, that is all material that you could use for your essay. So that's uh, that's about uh, Canvas. And if you have more problems about uh, with Canvas and about this page, then please let me uh, let me know. Um, are there more questions about the lecture? Um, Hans, you you would also do a, a short tutorial. Yeah. Okay. So now the floor is yours again. Yes. Um, apart from the content material, I prepared some uh, practical notes that uh, I think are relevant in writing an essay, more in general. And uh, it's also based on questions we often get from uh, students. So the essay, I think the number is A1, uh, um, and it counts for 30% of the credit points uh, for this course, but it's an individual essay you have to write. And what we propose is that you do it on your own work so on your own selected use case and your own solution that you want to design for that and then focus a, a say on the societal and ethical implications it may have and suppose that i take this use case and i introduce this and this type of digital technology what kind of effects might it have on people and is that what we want or do I have to do something uh, about it? Now, we say individual essay, and that means that you have to write it yourself. Um, that is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. But um, we are not um, the thought police. Uh, these are difficult matters. So if you have to write it yourself, it does not mean that you may not discuss things with other people. And in fact, discussion usually makes your thoughts better. But the writing must be your own and the formulation must be your own. Science is a collaborative form of knowledge production. And um, so those things are never done alone. The idea of a uh, learned 
professor working alone on the attic is uh, totally unrepresentative of what science really is. But you have to write it yourselves. And why do we do this? Because many of you have a kind of engineering or technology background, but in technologies that have big societal impacts, you must, as a professional, and that whether you are a scientist or a researcher or a teacher or a policymaker, um, you must be able to analyze and reflect on societal and ethical issues that your technology is bringing. And we see that just as an integral part of your responsibility um, as an expert. This is the formulation of the assignments. Um, but we, as it said here, it's very much free format and uh, you can invent your own questions. This is just a uh, suggestion, but you have to adapt it to what you need for your case. You might also use, for example, a look, take a look at the Microsoft uh, company uh, AI checklist. Maybe that's relevant, maybe it's not. It's in the set of articles. So here you have to make your own uh, decisions. Um, what is a big issue often, and I already said this uh, last time, um, you will enter, and that's also the case in a master thesis or a PhD uh, thesis, you read a lot of literature. How do you do that? Because so you have limited time and so many pages. Then the first guideline is don't do detail, detail or close reading to start because you will never get there. It's more like do diagonal reading, scan the headlines as you do with the newspaper. Find out what the key concepts, what the key idea behind the words is, or the key message, or what they try to tell you, and pick that up. So, and that's sometimes called, it's kind of helicopter view. Uh, you must be a bit on top above all the, the big literature. A second uh, point that we often get questions about is how do you reference scientific literature? And um, we have students that are educating, educated, for example, in the APA style, that you have to do it in that way, otherwise it is not scientific. If you are interdisciplinary and we are like that, uh, you know that everyone, it's like culture. In, uh, <clears throat> in physics, they do it totally different from uh, psychology, where APA comes from, is totally different from, say, economics, where they use Harvard style. Um, this is an example, actually, from physics. And you see uh, just short numbered things. This is an example, and uh, Maria referred to that, to the uh, Digital Humanism uh, book. Here, the editors have decided to use the Harvard style that is different. For example, what you see is uh, you do not give uh, references a number, but you give the author and the year and also the format, uh, you start with the, uh, you do it alphabetically and you start with the uh, family name and so on and so on. Um, and then we have, and I, this is just a uh, limited list, because it's not complete. We have APA, that's the American Psychology Association. Um, they have a standard style. But you also have AMA, which is American Mathematical Association, and they have a different style. And APS is the American Physical Society. And actually, the physics example I gave, I used myself uh, in the APS uh, journals, like Physical Review. They do it yet different. Um, Springer, in its conferences, has certain habits. IEEE, uh, ACM, 
all they uh, all these referencing styles are different so the conclusion is every journal conference publisher and discipline has its own entrenched habits and you have to conform to that but you have to be aware that everyone wants to have it in a slightly different way now what should you do rule number one is just pick one but be consistent so do it only one way and use only one style in your uh... rule two is use a style you are familiar with for example if you have been taught into apa you do that if you are a physicist you do it in the aps way rule number three if you have not done this before then just pick one and for example you might pick one the harvard style which one doesn't matter but do it consistently and the priority rule is that content is king why do you reference because referencing is putting substance into your argument because other people did a study and came to these and these conclusions on which you build further then as a reader I would like to check your argument, validate your argument, and then I will go, for example, you say, you say these and these people said that and that and that, and I take that uh, as a starting point, then I want to check whether you can be believed, and then it must be e easy for me as a reader to trace and find your reference. So the completeness not so much the format but the completeness of the information so that i can find it back that's the rule number zero that has priority over all rules then writing is pretty hard so also here uh, you should not get stuck in detail early that's the same as in reading but construct a kind of you have an essay of a number of pages um try to construct an overall story so make a skeleton or a set of bullets bullets or a set of headings and subheadings because in the headings that's how you read newspapers you follow uh, the headings and then you have a pretty good idea of what the uh, newspaper article is about you might follow the same procedure then if you have these headlines or bullets you flesh them out so you made them into real text it is pretty common that that does not work correctly the first time so you have to iterate a few times and you have to consider uh, that's sometimes forgotten if you write you are working on your paper but what you really do is you talk and have a dialogue with your reader you want to convey a message to your reader so you talk to an imaginary reader and have a discussion with this person and then you have better writing and then in a final pass um, it's easy to be too long and have things that are not so terribly good in the end you have to straighten out and often shorten your essay and i have two rules for you here one by Cicero or Cicero, the famous uh, Roman orator and politician, and Einstein, who you probably have heard of. Cicero is famous for a quote, which is probably not uh, really from him, but um, it's a well-known uh, way of saying, if I had had more time, it would have been shorter. Uh, he wrote a lot of letters to friends. And uh, it is, legend has it that he wrote this in uh, one or several of his letters, that his letters were too long and a bit boring, but he didn't have enough time to uh, correct that. That's also a good rule for yourself. Certainly, you spend, it's wise to spend some additional time at the end to make it shorter. And better understandable we say in the assignment three to five pages or about 1500 words what does that mean this is not a strict rule like you have in certain conferences if it's one line too long then uh, you're out that's not our idea but 
in one page, you can probably cannot say enough. If you have a, a single sentence, uh, AI is pretty scary, then okay, you have a line, but um, that's not good as an essay. On the other hand, you cannot uh, write 10, 15, 20 pages. You don't have the time. Uh, it's too much work. And most likely, if you have to do that in a short time, you are starting to babble in a long-minded fashion. So that's also not what you want. So that's why somewhere about three pages that is doable and you can convey a message. And use the rule of Einstein. And Einstein is reputed to have, uh, have said, make things as simple as possible but not simpler than that. So in a sense, bias um, is already there. You make it simpler than it really is. But if you try to get in all reality, people will not understand you. So you have to simplify it. But there is a limit to simplification. There is a certain point where it switches from pretty correct picture of the reality to a pretty incorrect. Yeah. Um, so make it as simple as possible, but not simpler than that, what is possible. And apply Kikoro's rule in finalizing your essay. And you do that by removing unnecessary or complicated or long winding phrases in the last path across your essay. Okay, that's are my practical tips, and I will uh, later I will be available for discussions about that uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Hans, for a very nice uh, tutorial on how to write uh, a good essay and uh, and and on your first lecture about AI ethics, which is uh, very relevant in this course. Um, so I hope uh, if there are any questions. Then we can uh, then discuss them now. Um, so the idea is that uh, that you, that all the students will, uh, will 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 use this this information to um, to write their 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 essays. There is one question I saw one question about um, from uh, Siaswani: How to write an AI essay on a topic that isn't too broad? Um, what do you really mean by this? Can you explain that, please? Yes, uh, hi. 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 Yes, I have not have a clear idea of the topic that I should choose. I mean, should I uh, spend on an AI topic to um, to relate with uh, the pro current problems related with AI or to get the, uh, to give the topic, to present the topic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hans, can you answer this or? Um, Right now, I think I have not have a clear idea which topic you choose for AI. Okay, uh, well, I can I can try to answer. So we expect from you that you that you pick a, a topic on on AI that is related to ethics, um, and it and we would like it to be related to the use case that you're going to do, but it's not really nece necessary. So it can be a broad topic or, or a, a smaller topic, depending on what, what you what you would like to, uh, to, do, to discuss in your essay. The point is that there are many aspects um, that we, so we are in this course, we are, um, we aim to build or to design a technology for a certain use case, and it must be a, a technology related to AI, so AI for development. So we are trying to, to pick uh, what is uh, what is already available in AI, and see if we can apply that and 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 adjust that to a situation in one of the use cases. But on the other hand, we must also reflect on what the negative aspects of it may be. So, for example, if if you apply a certain technique, we have seen that there are so many problems with AI that are not yet uh, discovered. There are some potential problems with AI, and it's good to discuss them before 
we start to implement AI widely in, in the world, actually, and, and, and data science, to be aware of what the, pro the, the potential uh, risks are about the biases, about the problems, uh, if it can do harm to people, if uh, it, it includes decision making at a level where uh, people who are involved do not um, uh, yet what affects their lives without them having uh, a say in it. So, so the, the idea of this course is that we together and you in teams that you discuss what the potential problems or, or ethical aspects might be of in implementing AI and to be critical eh? to not be just techno optimistics uh, thinking that technology will uh, in the end be the solution for everything. Yeah, we think that technology can do a lot, but on the other hand, we must also look at the risks and, and where can it be, be very successful for some people, it may be harmful for other people. And I think if you take that in, in, in your mind as, as problem uh, and you look at your use case with, that, with, with those eyes, then you can find probably a topic. And you can also read in the newspapers because there is a lot of um, writing about AI and, and risks and potentials and, and, and problems. And you can maybe combine what you read with what you discuss in your team and what you see in, 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 yeah, in your work. Uh, so we hope that uh, that will inspire you to write a good essay. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. This answers your question. Um, I have some other questions in them. Yeah, I, I had a question from Gideon. So I put the literature that Hans uh, sent in Canvas. Not everyone is on Canvas. And we have an open platform, which we are also filling uh, now, uh, gradually filling with all the information. Uh, the problem with this literature is that some of the literature is uh, is actually not open, so it's it's proprietors by an editor, so it has copyright, and we cannot just put it online. Uh, that is a problem because we really prefer that all literature uh, is, is open, but that unfortunately it's it's not. So therefore we put it on Canvas, which is a closed environment. But if, if somebody does not have access to Canvas, I can send it by email. So I already sent it to Gideon, uh, but uh, so that's that's the, the reason why we, we do not put this on the open education. Yeah, but most of the articles I selected are open access, so you might. And for some of the articles, uh, there are, uh, let's say, author versions that um, that are, for example, available uh, in archive. Uh, so that's kind of pre uh, pre-version of the official uh, version. And uh, when they exist, you can take them and put them on the ICT for the in the field.com. Okay. Um, Zoe has a question. Should we have our topic checked by you? Um, I think um, the best way to proceed is that um, if you want to have feedback, then you can uh, you can always ask us, um, and we, we plan to do uh, a peer review. Uh, so we want you to start basically right now and start thinking uh, about uh, things. We do not have to check your topic because uh, that is part of your ability that you can uh, select a good topic. And uh, indeed, the advice would be do not make it too big and too general. It's better to be specific and say real things about real issues. Um, so th the answer is uh, no, we do not check but we are willing to provide feedback or advice. And uh, the idea is that uh, in about uh, one week from now, you submit a first draft for peer review and then another student will review your draft paper and give feedback as well. 
and that's kind of exercise that you uh, also have to learn how to do review, uh, a good review of um, scientific work. Um, and <clears throat> then uh, that feedback will also be used, uh, can be used by you. So we have a different feedback channels uh, here. And then again, at the end, uh, we can also have discussions on things. Yeah, is that clear? I hope. Yes, I think um, if there are no more questions, then we just have a, a, a short break. So uh, we have a break for 15 minutes now to, until uh, 15 minutes now. <laughs> I won't say until the hour, the three hours. But um, so at, uh, after the break, uh, then we will split again in, in breakout rooms with, with the groups that, that are forming now. And we will have some, um, so, so Hans will, will probably leave because he is um, not available after the break. But I am here and we have Andre Baert, uh, who is also here. And we have Vlad, who is also uh, joining us. And we can um, discuss with you the use cases and, and what the problems are. And I'm still not really um, happy with the big uh, groups. So I, I want to, to discuss with you what we can do about it and how we can adjust the use cases in such a way that uh, it's interesting for you. So let's do that after the break. So take a 15 minute break and drink some coffee or whatever and see, see you uh, back in 15 minutes. Bye bye. And thank you, Hans, again for a very nice lecture.
zeg maar wanneer ik moet stoppen. Uh, you're still there, Hans. Ja, yeah. uh, Dolly is uh, Liam gaan ophalen. Oké, okay. well, that's nice. Then you can uh, stay with us. And we are here. Cha is also here and Francis is also here. So we are the full team. And Vlad has also joined. Uh, no, Francis is not here at this moment. I saw him this morning. Yeah, he was in. Yeah. So we have a full uh, support team for. Um, so. Yeah. And I think it's good to make the announcement uh, of Sa's uh, talk. That's why yeah. I put it up now. So. I, 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 will, I will do that. So when we finish here the, the dishes, because they're noisy. Yeah, I, I hear it. I will also make a poster today of uh, Giulielmo Tamburini's uh, talk in the same style. Yes, so um, welcome back from the break. Um, so you see here uh, the, the poster with the, the invited talk from Friday. Friday we will have a talk from Professor Sadito from UDS. Uh, he is a professor in uh, in agri agricultural economy, and he uh, will. But he's also uh, very involved in, let's say, in our team in ICT 4D. So from 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 the perspective of of rural development, uh, and he. Um, worked with us for the for 15 years we already worked with professor sadito um, he's a very close um yeah partner of ours and we uh, had done a lot of uh, field trips also with him in burkina faso in ghana and he will lecture uh, a very important to give an important lecture about ethics and and ict and ai um and how it um can have positive or negative impacts for rural communities so uh, Please don't miss the lecture because it's very interesting. So that is uh, for Friday. And for now, uh, so now we're going to work in, in the groups again. I'm going to make breakout rooms. And I want to have a discussion. So please go to your uh, to your the group where you, you are um, going to work. And, and then I will join you uh, to um, to discuss uh, how, how we will do it, and especially I want to discuss because I think that uh, the Ghana groups uh, have there are two groups on irrigation, uh, as, as I as I have seen it uh, now, and I think uh, they are quite uh, uh, well defined now. Um, for the, the groups in Sarawak, there is maybe the groups are a bit too big and we should maybe think if it's possible to split them even keeping the same subject. So I have to discuss it with you uh, and to see if the groups are balanced also in skills and in, you know, in, in uh, where, uh, yeah, where you will work on. So um, let me create uh, the rooms. I will stop recording now. <laughs>